some of the early trainings from the 1970s did focus on stereotypes, which is another way of talking about unconscious biases. And the idea there was to make people aware of their biases and to allow them to reflect as they're making a decision on whether they might have been biased in the decision. And so what we've seen, unfortunately, is that, as you say, the early versions of anti-stereotype training and then the more recent versions of implicit bias training don't seem to change people's implicit bias or explicit bias by very much. So sometimes you get a tiny effect after the training, but very rarely has anyone shown anything more than a very small and transient effect. And now, The Good Fight with Yasha Monk. It has been a tough few months. The coronavirus pandemic is still raging and no end is in sight. Our politics seems to have gone haywire. In Poland, the populist president was re-elected, which puts the country's democracy into real existential danger over the next three or four years. But there is one very bright spot, which is that I'm more optimistic at this point than at any moment since November 2016 that Donald Trump will fail to be re-elected. This is a product of two different things. The first is that Trump has failed to deliver on any of his promises and does not seem to have any coherent strategy for this election. You can see that by the way in which he's flailing about, trying to uh, find a powerful slogan, and ultimately, apparently over the last few days, going back to make America great again, which was a powerful slogan for him in 2016 when people could project the hopes and aspirations onto him when they could think he will come in and actually change everything. It is not a very powerful slogan when you've been in office for four years and people feel that the country has not gotten better on virtually any dimension. But there's also a second big reason for that, a reason that I think we are underestimating. And that is that Joe Biden is in the right political space, that he speaks for the vast majority of Americans, for example, when he says that he wants an economy that works for more Americans, that he wants to ensure that we fix our healthcare system, that we uh, have a tax system which doesn't favor the super rich to the extent that it does today. And that he speaks for most Americans when he expresses his outrage at the murder of George Floyd and police violence. At the same time, uh, he's not talking about political revolution. He isn't in favor of pulling down statutes or defunding police departments. He is able to stand for those values in a way that doesn't scare or alienate the vast majority of Americans. And I think when somebody is up by as much in the polls as Joe Biden is at the moment, it would be a mistake to put that down merely to the weakness of his opponent. To an extent that largely goes underappreciated by pundits, it is also due to the strengths of Joe Biden as a political character and as somebody who actually has his pulse on American public opinion much more than some of the people who now dominate political commentary in the country's newspapers and magazines. This is not to say that we should be complacent. A large lead in the polls can evaporate. The Biden campaign may yet make mistakes. Trump will be willing to use all kinds of tricks, including dirty ones, to surge back. But it is to say that we should look forward to these next few months in a spirit of hope and confidence that the opponents of populism may win the first really big victory since 2016 when America goes to vote in November. There's been a lot of discussions in the last weeks and months about how to remedy some of the racial injustices in the United States and other countries. One of the 
urgent tasks is to make sure that institutions and organizations, whether they be companies or universities that are lacking in diversity, that underrepresent key groups, make progress on that front, that they become more welcoming to those groups and also that they might manage to hire more members of those groups. But one of the strange things about this debate is that many of the initiatives that organizations are taking and many of the initiatives that people are loudly asking for at the moment don't actually have a good track record. And so this conversation, I think, is a particularly interesting and important one. It is with uh, Frank Dobbin, who is a professor of sociology at Harvard University and has spent much of the last years actually studying in detail what happens when companies try to do diversity trainings, diversity initiatives, what works, and sadly, more often, what doesn't work. It's really a detailed conversation about the findings that he and his frequent co-author, Alexandra Kalev, uh, have come to. And I think it gives a really good grounding to some of the sort of more abstract debates and fights that you're seeing on social media. I really learned a lot from this conversation, and I hope that you will too. Frank Dobbin, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. So I have a very simple question, which is that we've seen a lot of uh, serious and well-intentioned programs at corporations, at universities, at different American and international institutions to try and address a very real problem, which is the lack of diversity that many of them have, the underrepresentation of certain ethnic and religious groups, creating a better work environment, which makes people who come from minority groups feel more welcome in those institutions. And yet, as you put starkly in one uh, article for the Harvard Business Reviews, many of them have failed. Why is that? I think we are coming toward a pretty clear idea about why they failed over the years. So there's been a ton of research on the main intervention, which is diversity training. More than a thousand studies have looked at how effective it is, and it doesn't work. It does not change people's attitudes, and it doesn't change people's behavior. I mean, at the margins, a tiny bit, but if you kind of squint and look at the big picture, diversity training is not changing anything inside of firms. And it's not surprising. Many people come away from diversity training, especially white men, angry, frustrated, alienated, feeling that they've been blamed for something they didn't do. So generally, if you look at what's happened in the corporate world, over the last 40 or 50 years, the interventions that have been popularized, that have gotten the most attention and that have spread most widely, tend to do nothing or backfire. And it's partly because of the approach that companies and consultants take. So the approach is to try to stamp out bias at the individual level. So that's either through training by getting people to be aware that they're biased, which in theory, would help them to interrupt their own biases in the middle of making a hiring decision or making a promotion decision. In practice, it doesn't happen. Or through creating bureaucratic rules that will either punish people for discriminating. So in this case, for example, civil rights grievance procedures and sexual harassment grievance procedures, which are basically quasi-judicial procedures within the firm, that allows people to bring complaints when they feel they face discrimination or harassment, and then allows the firm to sanction the people who are responsible, which are, they're usually the managers who are in charge of the people who bring the complaints. So these approaches, punishing people, trying to train people to explain to them that they're biased, those approaches, and the approach of putting in bureaucratic mechanisms that are supposed to halt bias in the hiring and promotion process. So, for example, job tests for all new employees or all employees are, who are to be promoted and the use of performance ratings to promote people, grievance procedures, job tests, performance ratings, they're all designed to try to control bias in managers. And so is the typical training program. And managers don't like to be controlled they resist control of any sort. So they resist new rules. We've known that for decades. I'm an organizational sociologist. We study management. So one of the things we know is when you introduce new controls on people within a firm, 
their first reaction is to rebel against the controls because people like to feel efficacious. They like to feel like they're in charge of themselves. They like to feel like they're the decision makers. So I think the big problem is that we have doubled down on these approaches, punishment, bureaucratic rules, and training. Those are the things that are the most widespread. Something like 97% of firms, according to most surveys, have sexual harassment grievance procedures. Large numbers have, nearly as large numbers, have grievance procedures for civil rights complaints. The Fortune 500 companies virtually all have some version of diversity training. Smaller companies less often. And most companies have bureaucratized hiring and promotion so that they're using performance ratings, job tests, some kind of skill tests to hire people so that managers won't be able to act on bias. So these things are hugely popular, but they don't work. They backfire. Help us understand, first of all, what the landscape of these kind of trainings looks like. I feel like there's a lot of viral stories. What would some of those trainings look like? Um, perhaps a lot of people who listen to this podcast have been in one training or another. So first of all, are they relatively uniform? Which is to say, you know, if you're in one Fortune 500 company versus another Fortune 500 company, is it likely that the kind of diversity training you encounter is largely identical or relatively similar? Or is there huge heterogeneity in the kind of training you might encounter? And then, you know, if it is broadly the same, what does that look like? Well, there is quite a bit of heterogeneity in what the training programs look like. So they can range from 20 minutes online focused on the law and what you may not do as a hiring manager, for example, what you can't say to people, followed by an online quiz. And if you fail the quiz, you have to keep trying until you pass. To the other extreme is a one or two day in-person session with a small group. And usually it's management executives. It's a top management team that gets the high end version of this training with a professional trainer where they're quite interactive. There are often group exercises. Those trainings are not so much about what you can't do. They tend to focus on what kinds of biases you may have without realizing it. So implicit bias training has become popular. There's been a lot of variety since the 60s when firms first put these in. Interestingly, I think in the 60s, firms put in something like anti-racism training. They put in race relation workshops, often with civil rights leaders on stage or on video, people like Martin Luther King Jr. And now we're seeing a kind of return to anti-racism training with the popularity of books like White Fragility in the last couple of years. So one very simple question. So is something like the kinds of trainings that Robin D'Angelo offers, the author of White Fragility, is that mainstream within that landscape or would that be sort of at an extreme of what a diversity training might look like? If you're talking about the typical high-end intensive training for top-level executives you were talking about. Does that all sort of look broadly like what D'Angelo argues for in White Fragility, or would she be at, at an extreme end of what that kind of training might look like? I mean, what she offers is kind of a niche product right now, although it's obviously becoming very popular. She sold a ton of books. This approach to anti-racism training has caught on with a lot of trainers, so we don't really know right now. I haven't seen any studies looking at the numbers of companies that are doing this. But what's been popular for the last 15 years, what has spread among the big tech companies, the big finance companies, is a version of implicit bias training, where people usually do the implicit association test developed by Tony Greenwald and Mazarin Banaji and colleagues. And then they're brought together in some way or other, it's not usually social scientists who do this, but brought together to discuss and reflect on what their own biases are and how they can try to interrupt their own biases. So that's been the model, and we'll see whether anti-racist training takes over that. And so let's go through what this implicit bias training might look like. So I've taken the implicit bias test online. Everybody can go to the website and do that. As I recall, basically what it's doing is to ask you to pair pictures of different groups that you might be interested in. So if you want to have a 
test whether you're biased against people who have greater body weight rather than thin people. You might have pictures of people who are thin and pictures of people who are not thin. And so then you have to associate the pictures of people with good or bad attributes. And the idea is that because our brain associates, for example, if you're biased against people who are not thin, it associates that with not being as hardworking. It'll take you a little bit longer to click the right button for people to be hardworking if what you're seeing is the picture of somebody who's not thin. Now, that is very well established in the literature that people do, in fact, have these biases. But what seems less well established, as I recall, is whether that actually influences real life behavior, much less whether you can change that behavior. So what's the theory of these trainings and why does that theory not actually work out in practice? Well, um, some of the earliest trainings, especially from the early 1970s, the first trainings were in the early 1960s, but some of the early trainings from the 1970s did focus on stereotypes, which is another way of talking about unconscious biases. And the idea there was to make people aware of their biases and to allow them to reflect as they're making a decision on whether they might have been biased in the decision. And so what we've seen, unfortunately, is that, as you say, the early versions of anti-stereotype training and then the more recent versions of implicit bias training don't seem to change people's implicit bias or explicit bias by very much. So sometimes you get a tiny effect after the training, but very rarely has anyone shown anything more than a very small and transient effect, ephemeral effect. But as you suggest, I think more interesting is that we don't see any indication from these studies that tr these kinds of trainings can change people's behavior. So what you'd like to do is you'd like to change how managers make decisions, and it doesn't look like these trainings do anything. So how are you confident about that conclusion? I know you've put a lot of work into that. Tell us a little bit what kind of studies you've done in order to come to that sobering conclusion. Well, we've looked at the effects of different kinds of training on both corporate managers and university faculty, and we've looked at whether different kinds of training have effects not on what people think or how they behave, but on the subsequent diversity of the workforce. So if you have a training that's changing managers' beliefs and behaviors, you would expect that, that is reducing bias and reducing the behavior of discrimination. You would expect to see over five or ten years a growing diversity in the firm as managers stop discriminating. But we don't see that. We see for the most common forms of training. So the most common form of training is specifically targeting managers. It is mandatory, and it covers the law. So it's about how to not get into trouble. We see that that has only negative effects on diversity. It does not increase the presence of any historically underrepresented group, that is white women, African-American men and women, Latinx men and women, Asian American men and women, does not increase the presence of any of those groups in managers. So why would it have a negative effect? It doesn't surprise me that much, I suppose, but it doesn't have a positive effect, because for any training to actually change the behavior of people over the coming years is a sort of high bar. But for it to have a negative impact is more surprising, right? So what is it that might account for that? Well, um, what we see in a lot of the qualitative surveys is that people come out of training frustrated and angry, especially white men. And since the majority of white men are still managers, you have a lot of the people in training coming out frustrated and angry, complaining that they've been treated as sexist and racist when they're not. And, you know, one of the things we know from the sociological literature is people don't think they're sexist or racist. That is just to say they don't think they hold implicit biases. They don't think they have unconscious biases. So people react negatively. But interestingly, if you just make it voluntary, it makes a difference. So we see some positive effects for underrepresented groups when training is voluntary. So what's the logic there? If you force me to go, you're telling me I am racist and I have to be fixed. And if you say... We've got this training happening. We've got this seminar. Come if you like. 
then I go with a different mindset because I go thinking, oh, I'm a champion of diversity. Nobody's dragging me there. And further, if you don't mention the law, so if the training only covers why management would like to see greater diversity in the firm, to see better relations with customers from different groups, you see some positive effects there. The problem is that 75% of the firms that have manager diversity training make it mandatory, and 75% cover the law. And once you cover the law, it's over. Because if you mix the law in with your managerial and cultural reasons for promoting diversity, people only hear this is about legal compliance. If they cared about this, they wouldn't tell me about legal compliance. They'd give me a better rationale for caring about it. Very interesting. So does that mean you would, in fact, recommend that companies make it voluntary and try to avoid framing it around the law, basically getting people to say, all right, look, this is something we should care about. This is something we should be passionate about. And if you go to this training, then you're doing something for an important value, as opposed to this sort of more punitive framing where it is, you know, we've got to do that. If you screw up on this, we're going to get sued, you're going to get sued, and you're probably a bad person. I mean, what message does the latter send? It sends a message that the company doesn't care about that this. They're just doing this to prevent litigation. So as you suggest, when companies ask my team what to do, we say, make it voluntary and don't even mention the law. Never say, you can't say X, you can't do X. Talk about the positive reasons for needing groups to get along better in the workplace, needing to better understand customers. And the more specific it is to your industry and circumstances, like if you're in a tech industry that's welcoming a lot of foreign workers under H-1B visas, talk about that. Talk about this is the issue that we have to deal with. If you're in a tech industry that's not managing to recruit African-American engineers, talk about that. Cover the reasons why people really need to be there, and it works better. But I'll tell you, under the best of circumstances, diversity training is one of the least cost-effective strategies that companies can undertake because the online half an hour with an exam at the end version, there's no evidence that those do anything positive. So those presumably are cost effective, but it turns out that they don't do anything or at the worst they actually worsen the company's performance in diversity over the following years. What about the more intensive ones where you have a Rolls Royce program and the top executives come together for two days in a fancy resort probably and they talk about all this stuff. Now presumably uh, that costs the company quite a lot, but Perhaps if it does help it to reach those diversity targets, it might be worth it. But it sounds like that's not that effective either. Tell us about your findings on that. Well, in our research, when we look at live training with cultural content that's voluntary, we do, and this is usually the high-end version of current training, it does have some small positive effects. But they're just not huge compared to, for example, putting in a mentoring program. And the high-end training can be quite expensive per participant. But psychologists have done very detailed studies of the different characteristics of training that make it more and less effective. So it doesn't seem to matter whether it's an hour and a half or two days. So there's one study that shows 12 weeks, three times a week is a little more effective, but no company is doing that. That's Patricia Devine and her team at the University of Wisconsin. And there are some studies that show that participation is more effective than just being talked at. So some kind of group activities seem to be more effective. But it doesn't lo look like any of the tweaks you can do to conventional training really change the outcome in terms of implicit bias, explicit bias, and discriminatory behavior. It doesn't change them much. So let's assume that a uh, CEO is generally interested in boosting diversity rather than what I suspect a lot of CEOs are interested in, which is to say, be able to say they've done something, which is probably why a lot of these diversity programs persist despite these empirical findings that they don't actually help to boost the goals. Let's say, say, okay, look, we're getting rid of these diversity programs. This is not actually helping us, but we do want to do other things in order to serve those goals. What should they be doing? Well, um, there are a series of things that companies can do that instead of blaming managers or threatening to punish them or trying to brainwash them, which is how many people experience training, 
instead of those things, they engage managers in helping to solve the problem. So you can imagine that if you say to somebody, you're required to go to diversity training within the next month, and if you don't, your bonus will not appear until after you've completed it, which is what managers often hear. Managers don't respond well to that. So forcing them to go to some legalistic thing doesn't get them on your side. If you say, we're going to put together a task force to try to deal with the problem of diversity in the firm, can you send somebody from your department? Would you be on it or can you send your lieutenants? If you ask managers in that way to help be part of the solution, and then you bring them together on a task force that looks at the specific issues the company's facing, so look at the HR data. Is it a problem of recruitment of engineers? Are you only recruiting white engineers because of where you recruit? Or is it a problem of retention of women after they have a child? We could think of a solution for that. Is it a problem of delayed promotion for members of minority groups? How might we address that? So what we see is task forces are hugely effective, and they're one of the most effective things you can do. But the attitude that management has toward managers, toward executives, is not you're biased and you need to fix that. It's how can you help us solve the problem? So we see very large effects in the quantitative data, and we have over 800 companies over 30 years. We're now doing something similar with faculty task forces, and we see with 600 large universities over 25 years, very solid positive effects on tenured faculty diversity of just putting in a task force. As I was saying, one thing they do is they identify the problem by looking at the data. Another thing they do is they develop specific solutions to the problem. But they do two other important things. If you have a task force with people from different university departments or people from different business units, those people go back and they become the messenger. So they go back to their department or they go back to their business unit and they say, this is what we're going to do. And suddenly somebody in your department is the champion for diversity programs. And they also change the attitudes of people. So some of the most striking things we've seen in our interviews is that when somebody has been on a task force and we ask them about their experience, the typical thing we hear from a white man is, yeah, the CEO asked me to send somebody from the department and I just decided I would go myself. I believe in meritocracy, so I wasn't really a champion of diversity before. But then once I got there, we started to look at the numbers and I realized, so we've got 50% women, 50% men in the entry level job. But 90% of the people promoted to first-line supervisor are men. And why is that? Because we're recruiting super women into the entry-level job. So what could we do to fix that? Hmm. And all we had to do was fix the overtime. And it's interesting because often they'll say, I was a believer in meritocracy. But once I saw where the bottlenecks were, I realized we're causing this by our career system. By the fact that, for example, we promote people to partner at an average age of 34 years old, when it's not a great time for women to be working 100 hours a week. So there's an interesting question here, which is that in some of the more out there stuff that's being championed at the moment, for example, there are these documents that say that things like meritocracy are a hallmark of white supremacy or a hallmark of white characteristics. And there is a question, right? When there is a belief in meritocracy, which in certain contexts can be naive, I'm not uh, at all an opponent of meritocracy, but I think that there can be a, a way of downplaying problems of diversity by saying, well, it must just be that the people who get promoted have more merit and they will happen to be white men, but I guess white men have most merit and that's clearly not empirically well-founded. One response to this would be to try to train people not to have meritocratic beliefs to say, as these documents do, if you believe in meritocracy, that's because it's a biased cultural belief and you should be overcoming that. A quite a different approach might be to say, look, meritocracy is indeed important, but when you start examining the practices of your organizational institution, you will recognize the way in which it is not, in fact, rewarding the best people. Because if you're losing somebody because they're not willing to do a lot of extra hours, or if you're losing somebody because unless you are devoting all of your life to the firm at the age of 34 and you can't do that if you have a child, you're not, in fact, promoting the best people. Which of those 
routes seem more empirically well-founded? We currently don't have much evidence about whether anti-racism training that attacks the belief in meritocracy is effective. We certainly see in our interviews that some people give up their belief in meritocracy. They start to see that the deck is loaded, and it's loaded in favor of white men, typically. Just from how recruitment happens at schools that are predominantly white, from how promotion systems happen, from how hiring decisions get made. Often people favor people who look like themselves, even if subconsciously. So one of the things that I hope we'll see in the next few years is actual empirical research on how the new anti-racism training, which, you know, white fragility has become the book that a lot of people are referring to now, but it's not something that's completely new, how effective that is at changing people's attitudes. But what you were getting at is... How do you get people to see that their own processes and their own firms are not completely meritocratic? And that goes to the other things that are working. So, as I was saying, being on a task force often changes people's minds. They'll say, oh, there's a problem if you're a woman in your mid-30s. Or, oh, we're not recruiting black people because of where we recruit, so we can fix that. So the other things that are hugely effective at promoting diversity are doing special college recruitment, where you go out to historically black colleges or to predominantly Hispanic-serving institutions, or you send recruiters out to engineering programs that are majority white, but you try hard to find people of color. So special college recruitment is hugely effective. And what does that do? It sends existing managers out, and they see that there are plenty of highly trained, well-educated people of color, women, who just weren't getting into the recruitment pipeline before, who they could hire. So the people who were resistant to going to Howard University to recruit people want to go back the next year. The other thing that works quite well are mentoring programs particularly those that target women and minorities. And they work well partly because they give young women and minorities. They work very well both in the corporate world and for faculty. They give those people a champion, somebody who's on their side. But they also change the attitudes of those champions because in mentoring meetings, a young African-American woman will explain that She's gotten twice as many committee assignments as anybody else in the department because they want a person of color on each committee, and there's been no reduction in her teaching or anything else. So what we hear when we talk to faculty and administrators is that the average faculty member is just not aware that people of color and women face a different world than they do, and particularly in disciplines where there aren't that many women and people of color, like in the bench sciences. So I guess my question back to you is, is it going to work better to explain to people that the world is not a meritocracy? Or will it work better to expose white men, faculty members or managers, to people who experience the lack of meritocracy? And our data suggests that training generally has not been effective. I mean, we don't really know much about the current version of anti-racism training because it's so new. There haven't been studies that I know of. Well, it sounds to me, in in answer to your question, that it is much easier to make people recognize that many people who are meritorious are not currently being reached by the institution than it is to convince them that the idea of meritocracy is somehow inherently racist. And I have a normative reason for being mistrustful of that approach and an empirical reason. The normative reason is that I think it often runs the danger of itself embodying a kind of racism. And I don't mean by this a reverse racism against white people. I mean by that, uh, this idea that, you know, when some of these documents claim, for example, that a love of a written word or an emphasis on punctuality, or for that matter, an emphasis on meritocracy, 
are somehow inherently white traits, I think that that implies something deeply denunciatory and wrong uh, about people of color, who, of course, many of whom love writing and, and insist on punctuality and believe that the best should rise. And so, relatedly, I think it implies that if you have a meritocratic bar, uh, black people somehow couldn't clear it, which, again, I think is simply untrue. So that's why it seems to me, and when I think empirically, it'll be very hard to change people's minds about that. I mean, if you believe that you've gotten ahead in the world because you've worked hard and you think it's important for the country, for people to be rewarded if they perform well in their jobs and so on, making people change their mind about that, I think would be really, really hard. Now, on the other end of that spectrum lies the part that you're talking about, which is to say, hey, I know that you think really highly of our junior staff and they're all great. But you know what? We've historically recruited at, you know, whatever, the University of Georgia, and that's, you know, predominantly white. If I send you out to Morehouse College or to another historically black college, you'll meet all of these great young engineers. And once you're in a room with them, you'll be really impressed with them. And then you'll realize that we should be making greater efforts to reach those because, hey, they can add real value to our firm. We're, we're missing out on some really great candidates there. That doesn't require them to give up on the ideal of meritocracy. It just requires them to recognize that because of the practices of the institutions, they're not being as meritocratic as they might be. And it doesn't tell them this very strange story where, you know, meritocracy is racist because black people just somehow can't reach the same bar. It tells them, hey, there's plenty of highly qualified, great black people who would make wonderful junior engineers or whatever position you're hiring for. You just got to make sure that you go out and, and actually seek them out and actually recruit them. And so that helps to explain to me why those managers who might be sort of a little bit, do I really have to go to that college? And, you know, why? I mean, we've gotten perfectly decent employees from universities where we usually recruit. The ones we've gone out there and they've met uh, those young students, they say, hey, we found, you know, three great people for my team, and I want to make sure that we find three more great people next year. That seems much more intuitive to me. I think that's right. And I and just here a quick plug for your July 10th podcast, Is It Racist for a White Man to Bounce a Brown Baby on His Lap, which on this topic is just so insightful and interesting. I think the reason the most effective intervention we see is a task force is you're not even saying... I want you to go to Morehouse, which works. We see special recruitment works very well. You're saying, can you come together on a committee and diagnose the problem and come up with a managerial solution to it? And to a person, everyone we have interviewed who's been on a task force has said, I had no idea how bad it was. I had no idea that half of the people we hire as junior accountants are women and 10% of the people we promote to partner are women. And frankly, you know, the women we get tend to be, in terms of their scholastic record, at least as good as the men we get. And so I just had no idea. We're doing something wrong. We're just wasting a lot of talent by allowing that to happen. So there, you're not even saying do X, Y, or Z. You're just saying, let's look at the data. You guys look at the data, come back to us and propose some things. And you can see how... You know, that really gets, especially if you're an academic faculty member or you're a manager, you're, you know, you're thinking scientifically generally, you're thinking what's the evidence, what are the possible interventions. And I think that is the best way to change people's minds, to put them face to face with the problem. Yeah, I mean, that's very convincing to me that you have to treat people as partners in this endeavor. And I think from a lot of polling and so on that, uh, you know, at this point in time, perhaps this wasn't true 30 or 40 years ago, a lot of Americans, you know, are willing to recognize that there are real racial injustices in this country and they're willing to become change agents in that. But that's only going to be the case if you treat them as partners in an endeavor whose goals they putatively share and in whose goals they might become more committed over the course of serving a task force like that because they feel like, hey, here we are as a team working together to solve this problem. And if we do well at that, isn't that great for our firm? And can't I pat myself a little bit on the back for having helped to remedy one of those injustices? As opposed to telling them, hey, you're probably biased, you're probably racist, go in a room and feel bad about yourself for two days. That seems convincing to me. Well, and seeing racial disparities is, I think, a remedy to racial bias. Because if you see the disparities, suddenly you realize it's where we're recruiting or it's how we're promoting people 
or it's who we're training for management jobs and grooming for management jobs, and if we we're not doing that completely fairly. So if we change that, we can change the, what this company or what this faculty looks like. I want to end the conversation with a very straightforward question to you. It's not straightforward, actually. I should correct myself. So I've been reading a lot of the social scientific literature around democracy and diversity for the last few months. I'm teaching a course uh, relating to that, and I'm sort of slowly starting to write a book on these topics. And one of the things that I was really struck by in the literature that I suppose stands at the intersection between psychology and sociology is that really the most broadly accepted finding, for it's not uncontroversial, relates to intergroup contact theory, relates to the idea that the most effective way for us to reduce our prejudices against groups to which we hold negative feelings is to be exposed to them, is to have a lot of contact with them, but under specific conditions under conditions where our uh, divergent identity is minimized uh, rather than emphasized, under conditions in which we are working together for a cooperative goal, under conditions in which the institutions that we are part of frame us as having equal standing. And then there's a debate exactly about how strongly these conditions need to apply and whether there are some other conditions and so on and so forth. I guess my question to you is, first of all, you know, how convinced you are about that research paradigm where you think that integral contact theory emphasizing those conditions does hold the way it, it, it seems to me from my reading that it does. And then secondly, what we can teach us for this moment, because it strikes me that when I read about the way that some of these anti-racist trainings that haven't yet been empirically tested operate, we don't yet have the empirical evidence to say how they're going to work, but they seem to systematically violate all of the core conditions that the social psychology literature has uncovered over the last 50 years about intergroup contact theory and the kind of circumstances in which people do, in fact, come to have closer relationships with each other in which they do, in fact, manage to overcome some of that prejudice. It's an idea that was first proven during World War II when a Harvard sociologist led a team that produced this huge multi-volume study of the effects of the war on soldiers, of the American soldier, Samuel Stauffer. And they showed that when black and white troops fought side by side, which happened kind of randomly, whites' animosity toward blacks declined very sharply. Yet when whites were in completely segregated companies, it did not. So going to war together, but not working side by side, didn't help. And, you know, in Philadelphia Negro, W.E.B. Du Bois himself talked about contact between whites and African-Americans in the late 1890s in Philadelphia and identified that as one of the problems that sustained racism. So I do think that as a sociologist, one of the things my tribe studies is occupational segregation. And many of us work in workplaces where there are people of color, many white people. But often we work in hierarchical relationships where white people are the bosses and people of color are the subordinates. And we know from a bunch of different studies that that kind of interaction doesn't produce the sort of destruction of racial bias because that kind of subordinate, superordinate, relationship just reinforces the idea of racial hierarchy in people's minds. And I think it's one reason why mentoring works quite well, because what mentors say is, I saw myself in this person. This person is who I was 30 years ago. And so although it is, you know, it's a mentor-protege relationship, that's a very different kind of interaction than you get where you are the boss of a secretary who is a woman of color. So I hold out a lot of hope for that. What I find discouraging is that companies and university faculties have not done a great job of integrating the work groups so that whites and black and brown people have consistent reaction, consistent interactions with each other as equals. Frank Dobbin, thank you so much for coming to the podcast. Thank you for having me on.
Thank you so much for listening to The Good Fight. Lots of listeners have been spreading the word about the show. If you too have been enjoying the podcast, please be like, rate the show on iTunes, tell your friends all about it, share it on Facebook or Twitter. And finally, please mail suggestions for great guests or comments about the show to goodfightpod at gmail.com. That's goodfightpod at gmail.com. This recording carries a Creative Commons 4.0 international license. Thanks to Silent Partner for their song, Chess Pieces. <laughs>